Support for the Brewlosophy podcast comes from the following. The best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world. Find everything from classics to modern favorites, as well as cool experimental varieties and a vast array of ingredients and gear at yakimavalleyhops.com. Love to Brew is a national leader in homebrewing supplies, offering exclusive products such as East Coast yeast, TV taps, and Brewlosophy recipe kits, all with free shipping on orders over $75. When you need brewing ingredients or equipment, check out Love to Brew at love2brew.com. Welcome back to another episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and I am all you've got for this show. Uh, we're not going to be doing the typical uh, presentation that we've done in the past where we talk about an experiment that we've done, uh, but rather today I'm going to be talking with you about the incredible time I recently had at the New Zealand Homebrewers Conference and some of the, the really neat people I've met there and the innovative things they're doing in the world of brewing and beer. Uh, Mike Tonsmeyer, Gordon Strong, and I were all invited to attend and speak at the second annual conference where, in addition to giving some keynotes, we all hosted sessions, mine involving, as you might imagine, a live experiment where we uh, not only collected the data, but I presented the results live to the attendees of the session. It was a lot of fun. I'm currently working on uh, packaging all of that information in a really nice, digestible way, and uh, we'll probably publish an article about it at brewlosophy.com, though I'm hoping to make it uh, an episode here as well, because the, uh, the, the results were quite interesting. Uh, while, while I was at the conference, we also had the pleasure of meeting some wonderful people who are doing, like I said, really innovative stuff in the world of brewing. Um, one of them is the Grainfather guys. Yeah, another one is uh, Gabby Michael from Gladfield Malt. And so uh, just so that you guys could get kind of some insight as to what's going on in New Zealand... I decided to sit down with them and, and do some interviews. I also sit and chat with the guys who'd organized the entire event. Uh, really good information, and I, 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 I trust that you guys are going to enjoy what we talk about. Before we get to that stuff, uh, I have some announcements to make. First, uh, I, I'm sure as all of you know, HomebrewCon 2017 is coming up very quickly, and if you want to get the early registration pricing, you need to register today. Uh, this, this episode drops on April 20th. And today's the last day to qualify for that early registration. Of course, you have to be an AHA member, so don't forget to go to brewlosophy.com and click our link so that you can sign up to become an AHA member while supporting us at the same time. It's going to be a great time. Brewlosophy is going to be well represented while we're there. Uh, we're going to be having good conversation, great beer, and an all-around fantastic time. Now, I can't say too much about this. But Brulosophy is planning something on the side for those who do end up in Minneapolis. It's going to be a lot of fun. And again, I have to stay mom at this point, but we will be announcing something very soon. So stay tuned for that. Okay, I'm also going to be giving a talk at the Southern California Homebrewers Festival down in Temecula uh, early May. It's going to be a lot of fun. That, that's a, apparently you, you go down and you camp. This will be my first year attending, um, but it sounds like it's going to be a great time. So if you're in California and you're a member of the California Homebrewers Association, go register, come down, have fun with us, all right? If you enjoy what we're doing here at the Brewlosophy Podcast and over at Brewlosophy.com, please consider throwing some love our way. You can visit Brewlosophy.com forward slash support to see a list of ways to easily do so, such as using our links to places like Amazon, More Beer, Adventures in Homebrewing, Love to Brew, and many of the other places that you regularly shop to buy your homebrewing stuff. We are also on Patreon, which allows content creators like us to offer cool rewards to supporters who commit to a monthly contribution of as little as $1. Go check it out at patreon.com forward slash brewlosophy to see what you can get for helping us out. Now, just as a warning before we get into these interviews, uh, we were at an adult beer event where we were drinking beer and speaking like adults in a country where it seems they don't make as big a deal about certain words as we do here in the States. Uh, so I say this because there is some language used during the interviews that I didn't feel it would be too appropriate to censor out. So if you listen with children present and you don't want them to hear that kind of language, I might recommend that you save this one for a bit later. Also, these interviews were completed outdoors during cicada season while it was raining during a homebrew conference where people were walking by and chatting. I don't think it's terribly distracting. However, if you close your eyes, I'd like to think it can help you to transport 
uh, to being there with us when the interviews were taking place. Okay, the first people I interviewed were Trent Slater and Marco Haynes from Grainfather, makers of one of the more popular all-in-one brewing rigs that I had the opportunity to brew on for the very first time during the conference. Trent and Marco joined me to talk about updates to the original Grainfather rig, as well as really neat new products they are coming out with soon. All right, I'm here with some guys at the New Zealand Homebrewers Conference who are, well, they're, they're talking about grain fathers. They've got a whole grain father booth, and uh, I had the experience of using a grain father yesterday, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, before we get into it, I'd like to have them introduce themselves. Yeah, so Trent Slater. And uh, Marco Haynes. So Trent and Marco are here uh, representing Grainfather. We're having a bunch of fun talking about this thing, and they've got some new products up and coming that I wanted to have them share. But first, before we get into that, I, I, I feel like I have to talk about my experience using the Grainfather yesterday, because it was a completely different experience than what I'm used to, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Grainfather is a kind of an all-in-one brewing system. I, I, I feel like you guys might better be able to explain uh, how it works and uh, how long it's been around, maybe give some history on the product. Yeah, so it's an all-in-one, um, all-grain brewing system. So it incorporates your your traditional three three tier um, brewing system into one thing, um, including a, a chiller as well, a counterflow chiller for chilling down to pitching temps um, in a pretty fast time as well. Um, so it was launched um, in 2015, so it's been around for about two years. Yeah. Um, and uh, don't quote me on the numbers, but I think we've sold about uh, 15,000, close to 20,000 units so far. So it's fair to say it's uh, it's taken off pretty fast. Yeah, I've got a friend at home, uh, Matt Crispin from Accidentalist.com, who swears by his grandfather. And uh, looking at his website just now with you guys, yeah. we learned that he is on maybe an earlier version of the, uh, the, the the temperature unit and whatnot. I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about what people could expect from the new uh, temperature controller or whatever you guys are calling that. The whole It's like uh, the brains of the a, unit. We call it the control box. Um, so basically one of the problems with, uh, with the first generation controller is... Um, it didn't have the ability to dial in um, that those mash temperatures, the stability for the mash temperatures, um, basically because it had to switch between a 500 kilowatt, um, 500 watt, and a two kilowatt element. So, um, yeah, so so I would, I would oscillate a lot. Oscillate? Yeah. Is that a word? <laughs> Why not? Um, yeah, so so it was pretty hard to to keep consistent mash temperatures um, and. So we took that as the main thing that we wanted to improve, um, but in the process we actually kind of redesigned the whole um, the whole way that you approach your brew day. Um, experience. So so we, we added Bluetooth connectivity to it, uh, so you connect up to it with your phone, transmit your recipe on brew day, and basically it um, t- does all the thinking for you, takes it through all your brew steps, does automated uh, step mashing, and um, alerts you when you need to do your boil additions. Basically just, just makes it a breeze. <laughs> So this is true. I, it was so much of a breeze that it was almost confusing to me yesterday because it seemed like there were these things that I needed to do and I found myself off getting beer instead, And which, which for many of us is kind of, for better or for worse, you know, I, I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing. Um, but, but it was really, there was, there was a lot to it um, that I thought really simplified the entire process and yet I felt like I was still brewing. And I think that's a component that a lot of brewers are looking for is having their hands in the process. You're still doughing in. You're still responsible for pulling the, I guess, the basket out yeah, of, yeah. The, of, the, of the machine. Um, what, what is it about the grandfather that you feel kind of separates it from maybe other all-in-one brewing systems? Yeah, of course. Should I say the tagline? Um, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. The, uh, added automation without um, removal of any of the fun of your brew day. So, so that's, um, that's what we're all about. We want to make, um, you know, we want to harness t- the technology and, um, and, and use it to our advantage. But um, at the same time, you can just switch it off. You know, you can go to manual. You can go completely manual. And um, So this is what you would have been doing uh, yesterday. You were actually using the manual mode uh, versus our, our recipe mode. Um, which, is, which, which, in my opinion, is, is a good way to kind of introduce you to, to the system because um, the, the automation, the, sorry, the recipe mode actually makes it so easy that for someone um, new to the system, they might even miss some of the steps that's involved. 
Yeah, and to be fair, um, my automation came in the form of a Kiwi helping me out <laughs> to brew. So hey, every we, time... We throw those in, like... <laughs> <laughs> no Kiwis included. Oh, Lord. Uh, so, so yeah, it was, a, it was a great time. I thought it was fun. There are some things as Americans uh, who... We, we have differences, uh, obviously, in terms of uh, not just our accents, but, um, but in terms of our uh, power and the voltage that we use in our homes. And I was wondering if maybe you guys could speak a little bit to that and what we might be able to do to compensate for the extra, uh, the additional power to keep it simple uh, that, that, that Americans don't have that you guys do? Yeah, so um, t- traditionally on a, on a uh, 120 volt system, you kind of run into limits of, of how much current you can get out of your, your wall sockets. Um, and so that in turn, you don't have as much heat capacity to get your ramp times quite fast. So um, of course in, in America, you got the option to wire up a 220 volt um, appliance socket in your house and then get a 220 volt version grandfather and that'll just speed up your your ramp times and make your brew day a bit faster and a bit easier yeah that's a good point we um just just for some solid numbers we had three brews going yesterday gordon strong was brewing a rye summer ale um i was brewing a tiny bottom pale ale and we did a little short and shoddy version of that yesterday uh which was kind of fun and then uh we had michael tonsmeyer who was brewing up a saison uh a funky saison uh him and jesse were, were brewing together um the i think for all of us the longest it took f- to go from uh let's see post mash sweet wort in the I guess the kettle, <laughs> right? Uh, to boiling, I think the longest it took was maybe 12 minutes. Um, and that was 240 volt? Yep. Yeah, yeah so. it, was, it was just phenomenal. And it was so fast. And we're talking 23 liters, so five and a half gallons or so of, of wort, maybe a little bit more than that yeah. uh, to start with. And it was great. And, uh, and, and yeah, very fast. And I know that there's a bunch of other accessories people can use with their grandfathers to maybe speed along the process or, or to make the process easier and more convenient. Yep, so um, we also supply a, a, a sparge water heater, uh, basically a, a water urn um, that you can put the perfect amount of, typically for a 23 litre batch size, you got the t- uh, perfect amount of water in there. For, for those uh, who heard water urn, these are basically the, um, I don't know how to put this, let's see, the, the, like the, the, if you go to church and they serve coffee out of those things, yeah, 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 yeah. that's all it is with really hot water. And it was yeah. very convenient because the water was perfect to temp, to strike temp right when we needed a dough in, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's key, right? Yeah, <laughs> you do. Um, you, you want to have that there um, available to you, you know, when you need it. Um, so yeah, like I said, we sell them, but um, any tea urn will be will be um, yeah. And of course, capable. you want to make sure um, you get that sparge water hitting up in time, so that by the time you finish your mash out, that's ready to go, and you yeah. don't have to wait. I think that was, yeah, I think the entire brew day, let's see, we did a short and shoddy, we did with a 30 minute, ma- or no, we did a 20 minute ra- a mash rest, and then we went on to do a 30 minute boil, um, and all together, I think we were done in and out and cleaned up in two and three quarter hour. So it was quick, and we had all the water preheated. The urns are, are they're not the same, they look like the old church coffee servers, but they're, they're not exactly the same. They get a tad bit warmer, uh, and it worked out really well. So yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great machine. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, afterwards I got, I had a lot of, uh, I had a lot of brewers who were coming up to me who were watching the brew days asking, you know, what did you think? That's what we've been using for a long time. And it makes sense to me, particularly for people who are brewing the five gallon batches, um, which I believe 20, about 23 liters, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> corny keg, 19 liter, corny keg. yeah, right. So a typical serving size for a home brewer. Uh, it really was a, a, a lot of fun and so simple, yet I still felt still felt like I was brewing beer and I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. So uh, very cool thing. You guys are selling the hell out of those things. And that's really good to hear. Now, there's something else that you guys uh, was there anything else about the grandfather that you guys wanted to? Well, I just wanted, yeah, I just wanted to say to um, all our friends over in the U.S. that, um, yeah, the, the new controllers are available now. Uh, we're um, we're, we're um, we're stoked to have them available to you. So, um, yeah, just get online and, um, and, and look them up at thegrandfather.com. On top of that, I'd like to add, uh, check out brew.grandfather.com. Where we actually just launched a, a recipe creator community last week. Um, that's going to make it really, really easy for you yeah. to create your recipes, share them with your friends, get them onto your grandfather app and start brewing, brewing them straight away. If you can't tell, this is a company that loves homebrewing, <laughs> and, they, and I, I've learned that more than anything, probably, uh, with talking to, the, to Trent and Marco here and brewing with the grandfather and meeting a ton of people who brew with the grandfather here. It seems like it's really taken off, uh, not not just in New Zealand, but but over in Australia as well. I've met a lot of people over there who use it. So, you know, of course, the grandfather helps you to make wort. Yeah. 
And after you make that wort, you got to do something with it to turn it into beer. That's the one. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, so we figured we've got the brewing side down. So the next step that we had to tackle that we had to make easy for customers is your fermentation, dialing in those fermentation temperatures and just making it really easy to um, control your fermentation temperature and just make sure you... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you need. Uh, we wanted to get like a system where we could have, um, you know, the accuracy, and um, and there's going to be a whole a whole bunch of countries out there and a whole bunch of different climates and everything. So you know, um, we wanted we wanted to have an all encompassing product that could um, that could tackle all those different environments. So um, we've come out with a uh, a new conical fermenter. Well, soon, soon it's going to drop, but um, we've been showing it off here at um, at the um, uh, brewers conference here, um, and basically. Um, the new conical fermenter is going to have a um, heating element built into the base. Um, and then we're going to couple that with a brand new, um, which I'm really excited about, the glycol chiller. A glycol chiller for homebrewers that is um, very attractive. I've, I've seen one. It's, in, it's, in, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very, very quaint. Um, and it is so not what I expected when I first heard about this. A little backstory. I, I received an email from, from somebody at Grainfather uh, uh, about, a, I don't know, three weeks or, or so ago. And he was explaining this to me and just kind of giving me a heads up that there was going to be a new product dropping. And I didn't quite grasp. I, I think, you know, the home brewer mindset is that, you know, that's a pro brewer thing and that's going to that's going to you know require a ton of space and a lot of like you know you got to understand things that a lot of homebrewers don't quite understand when it comes to running things and all of that. I didn't mean to diss homebrewers with that, but <laughs> but the 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 seeing it today made me kind of you know, it really caused me to rethink what we can do as homebrewers. And I would love for you guys to talk more about it because I'm I don't get excited often, and, and I'm kind of excited about this thing. So it is basically uh, just to just to explain before I give these guys the mic over. Uh, it is basically a glycol fermentation system for homebrewers that can ferment up to four five-gallon batches of beer at the same time and control them to a different range of temperatures that I'll let you guys talk about. Yeah, so um, like you said, like the footprint is, is, is a big thing. So we wanted to create a, um, a compact system where the um, footprint of a home brewer um, didn't get impacted too much. So um, uh, the glycol chiller itself, it, it, it's small, it's quaint, it's, um, you know, you can, you, can, you can put it where you need to. Um, but uh, basically, the system is going to be um, the glycol chiller. Um, uh, it can be connected up to four of these um, jacketed um, conical fermenters, <laughs> and um, each each set with their own temperature and their own schedule. Um, I'll, I'll let uh, Marco go on about the schedule in a second because um, th- th- he's been do- doing some cool work on that. Um, but uh, Basically, yeah, we wanted to have something where you know, if if you um, needed 120 liters of <laughs> of homebrew and you had a had a lot of friends, then um, yeah, yeah, we set that up. I, I'd like to think that there are plenty of American homebrewers who are making 120 liters of beer at about the same time. Four four kegs. I know for a fact that I've got uh, uh, five good friends who are regularly making two batches side by side and presenting them to tasters for uh, experimental <laughs> purposes. Uh, these things are really neat. You can actually schedule fermentation profiles. You can make your own uh, a very precise fermentation uh, uh, schedules, and you can do that times four. Yeah. So each... Each fermenter can have its own profile. So n- literally next to an ale, let's say you're making a saison that you want to keep at, ah, uh, I, I can't do the Celsius conversion at this point in the day, uh, but let's say you want it at about 72 degrees, you can have a lager lagering at, down at, say, 34 degrees or, or 50 degrees yep. at the same time. I'm going to ask Marco to talk a little bit to me about how that works and the different options that are available to brewers. Because this, uh, this, is, this is perhaps the most exciting thing <laughs> about, the, about the thing for me. It's really neat. Um, so as we all know, fermentation temperature is basically the, the most important part of, of your whole fermentation, being able to control that. Um, well, so, so we designed a, a temperature controller that's built into this, this conical fermenter. It's, it's detachable. It's really easy to remove if you need to clean your fermenter. Um, but So basically we designed it specifically for the conical fermenter. Um, so you can, you can dial in your temperature. You can, so it's got up to four um, fermentation profiles stored on the controller. You can edit those. You can change them as you want. You can have up to five steps for each profile. 
So, so just to, just a. So this is, I'm even learning this now because we, we, I, this is, this thing has so many options. So you can set five different fermentation steps. So I don't have to go back and dial it down. I don't have to go back. It's starting to feel like an infomercial, but I don't care because <laughs> these are legit questions. So, so I, I set a fermentation profile for a specific beer that I want to make. Uh, and I can schedule when that beer, not based on OG, I'm assuming, but based on time. Based on time, yeah. So it's temporal. Okay. Uh, I can schedule when the temperature changes f- for that ferment- for that specific fermentation, and I can do that for four different batches at the same time. Marco? Yep, that's right. And um, not only can you schedule it to, to go up or down to the next step automatically, but you can also set, for each step, you can select whether or not that should go automatically, or whether whether or not you should be involved. If you need to check your, your gravity before you want to start cold crashing, you can set that up as well. So, um, so basically, you know, for, for a lager, you can, you can do your Krausen step, you can automatically go down to your lagering step, automatically go up to your diacetyl step, can, um, you know, put a, say, put a... Um, so you can, manually, you can manually adjust the temperatures if you want, or you can so set... What I, I was talking about it before, but what I was saying is, um, so yeah, so if certain fermentation steps, you're happy for it to go automatically, but obviously for some steps, you don't want it to necessarily start cold crashing once you've checked your gravity to make sure, right. you know, you're ready to, to, to start cr- crash cooling. So, so you can set that up on each step. You can decide, should that go automatically, yeah. or should you have some interaction before it starts cooling down? Or heating up that's so cool i i so so i mean you got this <laughs> you guys are like you were making literal home breweries like all together it seems like so you've got the you've got the the grain father to make the wort <clears throat> very easily you've got the well the, and the, the grain father i guess mashing brewing system and then you've got the grain father kegging or i'm sorry the conical grain father conical setup uh, that that will control all of your fermentation basically until the beer is done uh, my i guess the last question i've got about the this awesome <laughs> this awesome thing is uh what what are the options for getting that beer out of the conical and into the keg um, so there's a few different options um we sell uh stated well no once i said that we sell a <laughs> what would you what would you call it? It's um the, tap. the the kegerator. The, no, sorry, the tap. Oh, sorry, the, the, about getting the, uh, racking the the jewel valve. Oh yeah. Um, so the jewel valve is pretty unique. Um, you know, there's there's a few other um, companies out there that are using um, butterfly clamp systems yeah. and and um, they you know they're great, but they're big and clunky. Um, you got to really get in there and clean them and everything. Um, uh, the our, our tap systems um, a single tap, but. Um, We've basically got a clamp on the side of it that um, you can just leverage off okay. to, to dump your yeast. Um, and then up inside the actual conical, um, you can, uh, you know, sample or rack from there. And we'll sell different sizes of those. So depending on what you're doing, if you're getting like a, yeah. a double IPA or something like that, we'll have a longer one. Like oh, a, yeah. Yeah. Get above the true layer, basically. Yeah, exactly. So oh, nice. um, so we'll, we'll provide like options for that. And you can just, uh, you know, you decide before you're doing it what, what you need. So um, jam that on pretty easy. Um, so yeah, I mean the valve's great. Um, we're we're pretty pr- proud of it. Um, no one really on the market's doing anything like that. So um, and like I said before, it's 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 really easy to clean. Um, and yeah, just all about simplicity, really. <laughs> it means you don't have um, you know, usually you'd have um the port at the bottom for dumping the yeast, and then a bit higher up on the cone you have your your racking port, right. which is just another place that you have to clean and sterilize and potential source for for contamination. So yeah. so we eliminated the racking port, and just combined it all with with one hole at the bottom. Um, but I think the, the more exciting way to get your beer out that we'll be releasing as well is um, a pressure transfer attachment because the, the lid of the ferment has got a, a triclamp ferrule on it. So You read my mind, by the way. I was going to ask that next. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so we will be selling uh, a pressure transfer attachment. Um, basically, uh, I believe it will um, include or we will we'll be selling a whole range of, of, of parts that you need for your, your pressure transfer um, system. So like a, a low pressure regulator. Um, the the pressure transfer system will have a little um, low pressure gauge, so you can see exactly what pressure the CO2 is going into into the keg. And um, actually, you'll be able to use that to um, to put a blanket of CO2 over your beer while you're cold crashing to prevent the airlock from sucking oxygen into your fermenter. So, um, but maybe the the most um, exciting part of this pressure transfer system that no one else does is that you'll be able to insert uh, a stainless steel tube from the top through the pressure transfer attachment uh, with marking so you can select exactly where on the cone you want to rack from. (laughs) 
Uh, these guys are doing it all. So every question I come up with, you answer it. Uh, so, so you can uh, ostensibly, it sounds like you will not only be able to pressure transfer, but ferment under pressure as well. A, maybe a small amount, or maybe not. No. So the the, the conical ferment is not rated um, okay. to to ferment um, under pressure, but uh, it will hold up to five psi. So, um, you know, it's it's good to protect your beer from from oxygen, yeah. but. We wouldn't advise uh, pressure <laughs> fermenting in it. I, I'm, I'm really excited about the Grainfather. That's something that I've known about, I don't know, for the last couple of years, I think probably since it came out. And I've heard a lot about it, but, but as it continues to grow in America, I think there's a lot for us to learn. And uh, not only, you know, I think there are a lot of products hitting the market lately, all very innovative, all very neat, that, are, that make entering the hobby of homebrewing easy uh, for homebrewers, and I think the Grainfather is one of them. I think it's got it's really decently priced. I believe, to quote uh, uh, American prices, I think they're right about seven hundred ninety nine dollars in America, which isn't isn't bad. I mean, if you if you've seen what most homebrewers spend on their setups, yeah. their five gallon setups, it's not a bad price. What we'll hopefully see though is that people don't just view this as a as a new. As, as a new brewer tool, this is something that I had a lot of fun on. I've been brewing for what fifteen years almost, and it was and it was great, and it made the process simple. And I was still brewing, and uh, it was really neat. So, are there any other things that you guys are coming out with that you want to talk about with, or maybe some some? Yeah, I mean, w- with everything that we're doing, whether it's the conical, the glycol chiller, like we don't want to make anything redundant. Um, and it, and it's our aim to you know um, have some different options, especially with like the glycol chiller that's coming out. Um, there might be some options um, that. Um, uh, yeah, we'll come out with like a neoprene jacket or something, um, other other cooling options for kegging mm-hmm. as well. So um, we don't want to make anything redundant. We want to, you know, build on what we've got. And um, yeah, you'll, you'll see some pretty cool stuff coming out soon. Uh, yeah, we've, we've actually got another product um, on the way. We're um, working on launching an um, electric grain mill. Um, so basically a really, really solid um, aluminium construction frame. Because, you know, t- um, typical grain mills, it's, it's kind of a flimsy affair that you have to put together. This will be really, really solid with a, with a um, specialised drill motor built into it. So basically you just set it up, press the button, and then you can just feed the grain in as you need. So it eliminates the hand cranking, but also eliminates, um, you know, with a typical drill, if you attach your drill to a... Uh, to a mill, you still have to uh, make sure you do the right speed. You can't just lock it into full blast and, and leave it going. So, so this is specifically designed for the right. We've got different settings, uh, different speed settings, specifically for the right kind of motor speed for for optimum milling for the type of grain that's being used. Yeah, yeah so, you guys so are watch out for the the grandfather grain mill. I'll be keeping my eyes open. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I kind of feel like that too. But it, when you talk about such innovative products, it's hard not to sound like you're not selling it, and it, and it's just exciting stuff. And you know, people are going to think what they want. Okay, now real quick, I want to. I've got my my, my new friend here, Goose, um, who uh, I, we won't talk about ages because <laughs> the 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 age to drink and brew beer in New Zealand is far different than it is in America. Uh, but Goose is the man who helped me. He was my automation yesterday, uh, and he's the one who helped me to make Tiny Bottom Pale Ale. He's been using the Grandfather for how long, man? Um, oh, four or five years now. Okay. Um, well, not four or five, but probably actually three. Sorry. Okay, so he's been using a grandfather, uh, the, the, the original grandfather system for about for about three and a half yeah, years now. Years. Yeah, and uh, has a lot of experience on it, and was was very nice to have around yesterday when I was brewing. I wonder if you have what are your ge- kind of general thoughts on the grandfather, and if there's anything you'd like to share about your experience with it, because you seem sold on the unit, right. as as many people in yeah. New Zealand and Australia do. Uh, what do you think about the the unit and your experiences using it so far? I say so. My experience using it, I put 58 brews through the grandfather. Yesterday was our 58th, so. Um, and I love the system. I, I went straight from kitten kilo to all grain using the grain father. I got it for, my dad bought it for me for my birthday. And, um, nice dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, the condition was he gets half of everything I make. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, I love it all. I mean, there are a few uh, little things that you guys actually, the good thing about you guys is you listen to customer complaints and anything that is wrong with the grain father um, on the homebrew side, you guys do tend to fix. Um, my only little niggle would be the ball valve, but we, we went through that one the other night as to why that's in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, other than that, it's great. And it's only getting better and better. I mean... Um, because you guys just released a new control box, which is awesome. Um, I got to try it out yesterday and give it a go. I don't have one myself. Um, not enough money yet. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's so cool that you guys listen to uh, you know, people saying, 
we want to be able to do this and sit in the living room and drink beer. So, yeah. Yeah. so Goose, how long is your typical brew day when you when you brew a batch? Let's say you're not doing all the weird shit we did yesterday, right, yeah. but your typical your uh, your typical brew day uh, using the grandfather. Okay, so yeah, yesterday was the quickest one I've ever done. I think um, about an hour, but my typical brew day would be around four hours um, on a grandfather. So, uh, we I think yesterday we cut out about. Uh, maybe 45 minutes to an hour of a typical process. And that was par- part of what we were doing. And uh, we were done in what, three and a half hours, yeah. I think cleaned up. You, you came back and you said everything was clean. And I was kind of amazed <laughs> <laughs> that things were done. Uh, definitely that experience opened my eyes to a whole new world of, of what brewing could be. Yeah. Um, and I think you guys are, are on the cusp. You're on the, on the, on the cutting edge there. And it's so fun to watch. And I'm excited to see what you guys come out with later. Thanks for the interview. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks again to Trent and Marco from Grandfather for sitting down with me and chatting about all of the cool, innovative stuff they're doing at that company. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty stoked to have an option to be able to ferment four different beers at different temperatures with different fermentation schedules at the same exact time, all in a footprint that is essentially smaller than one single fermentation chamber that only allows you to ferment at one temperature. Awesome, awesome stuff coming out of Grandfather. All right, when we come back, an interview with one of New Zealand's most prominent malt producers, Gladfield Malt. I'll be chatting with co-owner Gabby Michael about some really neat stuff they're doing in the world of malt. Hang tight. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste time chilling work, which is why I use cleverly designed immersion chillers from Jaded Brewing. After some bad experiences with counterflow and plate chillers, I began the search for a more efficient chilling solution and discovered Jaded. That was nearly four years ago, and to this day, I continue to rely on the King Cobra and the Hydra to chill my wort in record time without the setup or cleaning hassle of other chillers. If you're looking for a way to optimize your brew day, I can't recommend Jaded Chillers enough. Go see what they have to offer at jadedbrewing.com and let them no brewlosophy sent you. Welcome back to the show. Now, I, you know, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with me uh, when I say that we're living in sort of a hop obsessed world when it comes to brewing and beer. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love me some hops, but I, really truthfully, my love, my passion has always been in beers that have that tend to have more of a malt character. And I've been fascinated for a long time with the process uh, that, that is required to make different malts, as well as the various ways of using those malts uh, to make different beers. So imagine my luck to sit down next to Gabby Michael, co-owner of New Zealand's Gladfield Malt, when we were judging at the Brewmania competition at the New Zealand Homebrewers Conference. We struck up a conversation. She's got one of those personalities that just draws you in. And so she very graciously agreed to let me ask her a bunch of questions about the neat stuff they are doing with malt in New Zealand. I'm here with Gabby Michael uh, from Gladfield Malting in New Zealand. What what city of New Zealand are you from? I'm from Dunsando, actually, uh, the South Island. The South Island. That, there's two islands of New Zealand, and she's from the South one. So um, I actually met Gabby. We were judging together at Brumania here in New Zealand, and I uh, happened to just plop down at the table that she was at, and we were doing a really interesting judging thing. And uh, I learned that she was co-owner, actually, of, of Gladfield Malts uh, Malting, and, and we ended up talking a lot about this grain that we all love so much. And it kind of excited me, and so then we started spending time at the the following day, which was which was uh, just yesterday, uh, with me tasting a bunch of malts and telling her what I thought they tasted like, and we had a lot of fun doing that. And again, my excitement over the product that Gladfield here in New Zealand is producing uh, skyrocketed. So I thought I'd sit down and have a conversation with Gabby about what it is they're up to at Gladfield Malting. Do you mind giving us a little bit of background? Yeah, I know. Well. First of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, malting. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very odd business to have, to be fair. Um, it's all about the hops and the craft beer at brewing, but uh, we decided to buck the trend and go malting. Uh, but what we started was more because my husband is a, f- a grower. So Doug is a barley grower, and he's been growing for five generations. And he got sick of not being paying enough. And he was paying for the same amount that his uh, dad was being paid. And the cost for growing the same amount of barley tripled. 
So it was not sustainable. And we also had sheep, which is a lot of work. So it's just, you know, if you want our kids to have a piece of land, we'll have to choose which one. And that's not fair. Um, you can't choose amongst the seven, you know, your yeah. child. <laughs> and uh, yet to say who the one's going to take the family farm. So he come up with a plan and he's a kind of a, a do it, you know, ask Doug, get things get done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, say, I'll make my own malt. Because we learned that everything was being imported, and that's a sacrilege. Because New Zealand grows amazing barley. For for you uh, in America that don't know this, that New Zealand is a very small country, but has a lot of flat land where it is in Canterbury, and the flat land is very productive, and it's got a beautiful maritime climate. So it's got the lovely. Um, Cool, cool uh, climate to grow, and then this comes the summer, and the the nor'wester winds. It comes from the Alps, which is dry and hot. It dries those crops um, naturally for us, so we don't uh, need to worry about drying the barley, which makes the barley even more special. Hmm. Uh, no black spots like you have it in England and in German few places uh, around the Europe. So we have a very prime product to work with. And so why not turn it into uh, malts? And that's just what we've done 14 uh, years ago. That's It's such a cool story. And, and it's funny that you bring up the climate, um, only because my wife, who you met, you got to meet earlier, when she made fun of me, right? Yeah. Laura's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, but, but my wife, you know, all, you know, it's been raining since we've been here in Nelson, and, and it's been pleasant, perfectly pleasant, and I know Sunny Nelson. Um, oh, but I'll explain in a few words what New Zealand is. It's a freaking island. Two islands with the Alps and right in the middle of it, and we're closest to Antarctica, so it's very volatile. You can get four seasons into one day easy enough. That's four seasons into one day. That's wild. Uh, and so I, I think uh, beyond learning about the amazing malts that you guys are making, uh, learning about the climate here has, has well, just been a, it. it's crazy yeah and, and and new zealanders are so or kiwis i should say are so proud of that mm. well you guys are making an entire portfolio of every malt that i think most people would ever imagine using yep. and i'm not gonna we don't have the time to go over every single one of them so uh, on top of all of the traditional base malts i thought maybe we could talk about some of the fun stuff you guys are doing that that, that, that perhaps you think is different than maybe what people are being offered now and i think it, i think it, it is difficult to get glad fill malts in america right now but but for those of us who are loving what we're seeing here um and and, and enjoying the beers that we have tasted made with those malts i think it's uh, about time we start working to get some Gladfield malts over on the U.S. Um, and I should say that most of the beers I believe that we are drinking in in New Zealand are made with Gladfield malts, at least to some extent. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we're very proud of that. Yeah. We're proud of that. Some uh, brewers talk our products uh, very seriously, and we yeah, we grew with them. You know, some of brewers that have um, been buying from us is from day one of their brewing career. We're very proud of that. Yes. And, but, you know, the thing is that we... We evolved with the industry because we are not the traditional maltings that you are used with, Mm -hmm. the 300-year-old maltings that have been going for generations. We are the first-generation maltsters. So we can change, we can add, we can take away whatever you need. And that's sort of a a very unique position to be. And the other point that we like to say about Gladfield is that we are actually a medium-sized malting, so our capacity is enough to keep a commercial brewer going. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're not small uh, enough to be very unique. Uh, so we're small enough to be unique, but we are big enough to be sustainable and consistent to a brewer. So a brewer can use 100% Gladfield malt for years to come, and they won't need to worry about his malt supplier. So it's important. Size in maltings is quite important. You need to have capacity, and we've been working very hard on that. One of the things that you uh, said to me when we first met that I thought was really impressive was that you're because of the fact, perhaps of your because of your size, but also because of the region that you are uh, selling your malts in, you are are able to have more of a focus on the craft and home brewing uh, side of of uh, the, the business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we are small enough to care. Put it this way, yeah. and I know all my clients. I visit ninety nine percent of them. I know where the breweries are. I know like the home brewers. We keep it very close touch with them. Hence, why we're here. Mm-hmm. And you know, I just knowing what they want and listen to their feedback. I mean, that's something that I said. I just listened to a couple of feedback 
today. Mm -hmm. And the, when I say feedback, I don't say compliment, okay? I say feedback is that something that we're not doing quite right. right. And I love hearing that. People say, oh, don't you take it to uh, offense or don't you take it the wrong way? And I said, how? why should I? Because the guy had got enough uh, courage to come and tell me what I should do best. So he cares enough about me. Right. And uh, I just go back and say, well, I can actually change that. And we mm -hmm. go back because I said, again, it's a small enough to care. And then because we can move and edge out side, you know, side steps, we can make makes better products. Yeah. Okay. I think we should get into talking about some of these amazing malts. So, <laughs> uh, you know, when you meet someone and they, and they kind of talk up their product a little bit, I mean, no offense to you, I Gabby, you're kind of like, yeah, yeah. You're kind of like, oh, great. Um, so, so when I arrived at the table and you started pouring all of these different grains in my hands and I started tasting them, uh, there, there, there was a first one you poured in my hands that I want to talk about a little later. Cause I think it is fun and kind of exciting. Uh, and so instead <laughs> what, what I'd like to do is kind of go in order of base malt through specialty malts. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I make a lot of Vienna lager and my common uh, recipe these days is now 97% Vienna malt. Yep. So I just mostly Vienna malt yep. and 3% pale chocolate. And the reason I do that is because, uh, Pale chocolate uh, adds a, a nice nuttiness without being too roasty, but it also has kind of a roasty edge. Something I expect at a 3% level to get in a Vienna, yeah, Vienna lager. To exactly. Well, when I was to, and I, and I eat my malt before I brew with it every day, especially my base malt. As I was munching on some of your Vienna malt, mm -hmm. I had this kind of epiphany that, wow, this tastes exactly like the Vienna lager that I want to be drinking <laughs> without the pale chocolate. Um, wow. And I, yeah, and I, and I, and I, and it was so easy to eat and it, t it was almost like a snack for me. It was so tasty, perfect amount of sweetness, but it was still dry enough and toasty enough to have that. And I'm chewing on it. I'm not drinking a beer made with it, but it had all of the characteristics I'm hoping for in a Vienna lager. I don't know if you can speak to that or if maybe the Munich malts and stuff like that you're talking about, but what is it you're doing to make this <laughs> stuff taste so good? Well, thanks for the compliment, Marshall. That's awesome. Yeah, it's great to hear that our malts are hitting the, the mark. But the Vienna and the Munichs, uh, interesting enough, it's one of our most sold malts um, ah. after after the the, malt, the base malts. Uh, it just flies out the door. The reason why we're making good quality Vienna in specific is because we have the time. We don't shortcut the process. We have a kiln germination vessel that where we make, and we're only making it a maximum of 20 ton at a time. So it's quite small for when, you, when you're thinking about you know, mass production, 200 ton batches and some mouldings around the world. Mm -hmm. So we're making a max of 20, 20, 30 ton, down to 10 if we have to. And, but we got the time. So it's not a production line mm -hmm. for Viennas and Munichs and any of our malts. Uh, it's that, is that ready for, uh, for the next, the curing stages of, um, so curing is when you're actually building those sugars up at kilning um, uh, stages. And if, if the curing is not, doing, not um, there, we just bring it up to the point. There's nothing behind us saying, you can't. You haven't got time. You got malt uh, on a system, barley on a system that needs to be, um, you know, coming into the germination box. You can't. You can't wait. So almost uh, the the quality of the malt kind of outweighs the time that it takes to make that malt. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, it's no use us going and uh, making, going to a mouldings and trying to do what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. We want to be specialized malt. You know, we are very proud saying that we are the world's best pure malt. Mm -hmm. And we don't say this because, oh, it's just a marketing uh, slogan. We say because we believe in it. Mm -hmm. And we want every malt that we make is no shortcuts. The barley that we have is, is, is the malt, the barley that's got the right protein levels, the right germination percentages to be able to perform at the germination and kilning process. Mm -hmm. So in the Vienna and Munich are classics. When we talk it's actually very a quick story as I say we took our Vienna and Munich to Australia for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, I had a brewer that said that doesn't taste like Munich. And I said wow what do you mean? Well, me by being me, our inquisitor. So what do you mean? Why not? So hang on, stop there. He went into his uh, malt, malt uh, yeah. room, grabbed me a bag of uh, Munich, and then I chew on it and I said, "Well, that doesn't taste like Munich." <laughs> <laughs> so, but and then he made. Uh, so we put it to the test. Like, look, the best thing for you to do is just make a Munich style um, uh, beer and see which one stands out. He came back to me and I said. 
I, I very similar what you said about the Vienna. I don't need any other malts. I only need yours. Yours is full of flavors. So I haven't tasted anything like it. So it's again, there's, there's simple things that makes a difference. Yeah, it really seems to be the case. Um, let's get into some of the more interesting. You guys, by the way, they're naming conventions for these malts. I'm just going to go over some of the fun <laughs> ones. Um, let's see here. They've got a malt called Shepherd Delight. They've got a malt called Sour Grapes. You can probably guess that that's their version of acidulated, right? That's right. Uh, they've got Supernova Malt. Um, and then they've got one that I'd like to get to now that, that uh, has been talked up quite a bit since I've been here in, uh, and it's called Toffee Malt. Not coffee, but not toffee, toffee Malt. And before I met Gabby and before we started talking about this whole thing, I kind of started making some assumptions as to what this Toffee Malt might be. Um, and then I threw some in my mouth and was kind of uh, surprised with what, what, with what it ended up being. And I'll, I'll let you kind of talk about yeah. <laughs> what, no, what Toffee Malt is. Toffee is the most interesting malt that we make, to be fair. <laughs> the one that's really out there. Every malt that we, uh, most of the malts that you have is a below or below four percent moisture. The toffee is seven percent. Like it's a frown upon in the malt industry to have a, a high moisture malt. But we come up with toffee it was almost an accidental. Like most of the malts that we uh, come up with, our rice is a bit of a trial and error. Like supernova is a classic one. But toffee came uh, as a necessity to build up mouthfeel into beers and um, without adding sugar, so without adding colour, I'm sorry. So we were, th- um, brewers were using too much crystal to build up their malt, um, their uh, malt cushion that we call it, and it just wasn't right. Yeah. So the toffee came in as in a very under-modified crystal, uh, but chewy, so you don't need, you can use as much as 20% if you want, but you can use as 5% to give that lovely sweetness to the beer without adding any colour to the beer, which is unheard of in any malt, malting, malt that you buy. So you can make a colour, an, um, um, an, a, a big IPA, uh, with we've got a light a light uh, a light lager, which is only uh, two point seven EBC, and then you can add the toffee, which is uh, only twenty EBC, and makes it a very very light beer, but it's got so much melt feel on it that you have no idea how the brewer um, achieved that. So yeah. that stuff is your, my surprise malt, put it this way. And, and I, I, I don't mean to talk bad about some of the uh, home brewers that I, beers who I, uh, you know, double IPAs and, and other big beers that I drink where they're, where they're just throwing tons of crystal malt at it, which you guys make fantastic crystal malt as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that needs to be said. This is not a crystal malt necessarily. This is kind of its own thing. Yeah. Um, and, and you have these double IPAs that, you know, after, um, after say three weeks in the keg, they just taste like oxidized crystal malt, yes, uh, and so, and so it seems like there, I, um, I, I, there, there are some breweries, perhaps in the states, that could maybe benefit use, from using use a, bit a bit of, of a toffee. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it is known that. Um, Especially IPAs. I've just been on a talk with the behemoth. Andrew is saying don't use less than 5% of light uh, crystals on your beers. And is that right? Like you can use 5% of toffee mm-hmm. and bring it up. You have a lot of cushions without adding that caramel, without adding all the unnecessary flavors that you want. That will clash with your malt, with your hops, anyhow. Yeah, and I and I um, just as you know, I we I think a lot of home brewers and brewers in general like to chew the malts that they're to taste the, the malts that they're going to be using in their beer. And this is one of those ones where I, I you gave me a forewarning: don't bite too hard because it's, <laughs> it is very chewy. And I and, and that's tough. For, it was tough for me to imagine, but um, a good analog would be uh, something like chewing on a laffy taffy or a now and later, some sort of a hard candy, and it kind of sticks in your teeth, unlike most malts yeah. that just kind of crack up. Hard and, uh, candy is a perfect um, yeah. Yeah. description for a malt, which is very unheard of. Yeah, yeah it was very interesting. Um, well, besides that, you've got some other ones. Are there any other malts you'd like to talk about? Uh, yeah, probably our most um, world-renowned malt will be the Manuka smoke malt. Ah. Yeah. So that's a very intriguing malt because the Manuka, it's a type of tea tree. <laughs> and the tea tree, it grows um, native here in New Zealand. And it makes a beautiful honey. So the bees use the flowers of the manuka to produce the, the a very medicinal medicinal um, uh, honey, which is sold around the world for a lot of money. But the the, the wood of this uh, manuka tree uh, bush, it's it's quite special. It's got very savoury uh, tones uh, notes to it, which you, 
one day we were sitting around the table, Doug and I, and say, like, what can we make that no one else can make in the ward? And the first thing that goes, manuka, because no other place in the ward, the manuka, there is a, is it, is it, is this different species, the tea tree. Mm-hmm. Um, it is kind of a lot of scientific nah, things behind, but I haven't gone there yet. Mm-hmm. But the flavor is unique, okay? No one can replicate this malt. And let's put New Zealand on the map. That's yeah. what we thought. So we make it. And the most interesting thing about the manuka smoked is that they're making whiskey out of it. Huh. Tell you what, man. Yeah. If, if you're into whiskey, uh, look look for the Manuka Smoke Whiskey. They are yeah. delicious. Uh, but the beers as well. You know, we actually, I believe we're making beer scotch, um, Scottish Isles here because of the Manuka um, uh, Smoke. But you know, we challenge them to use uh, the, the smoke, the mystify the smoke malts. Use it in any style that you want. It's a Pilsner malt that we uh, smoked it. Yeah, it just makes it, it, makes it a very interesting in a brewery. I've tasted. Uh, I, I'm. I'm. I've. 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 I've <laughs> I don't want to say I don't like smoked beers, but I kind of don't like smoked malt beers, and um, and particularly those that are made with very high amounts of smoked malt. But but I've had beers that are made with you know a, as small as ten, about ten percent. What what do you recommend for percentage usage, anyways? Yeah. Well, we are aware of a smoke frown upon. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I can't I can't taste anything after I had a peat smoked. Uh, right. beer or um, or uh, peat smoked whiskey so we were, we're aware of that yeah. okay so we, we want to cater for for the average for the for the for the average palate so we actually mild smoke everything that we make is actually mild smoke yeah. so the the, the manuka smoke is just a subtle smoke even on a grain you have to I love when um, brewers uh, come and taste the manuka smoke they shut their eyes the minute they shut their eyes I said they are getting it yeah. you know because it's all there it's just not a punch in your face yeah. but uh, so we recommend 30% of that, that malt to make it a very good um, smoke that's going to linger on your palate a bit longer. So what makes you think that, okay, I didn't think it was a smoked beer, but definitely a smoked beer now after I sip it. And, wow, I, I'm kind of like, do I have another sip or do I enjoy <laughs> what I'm just having on my mouth right now? So keep it interesting, you know. Definitely. So my, my experience with it was I've, I've had, I believe, three or four beers, one home brewed, uh, two or three that were commercially made with the smoked malt. Um, yeah. And it's a proud thing. They Manuka smoked malt is what they usually tend to say in the, in yeah. the, in the name they of the beer. They call it by name. Yeah. They call it by name. And uh, they, the, the reason I had so many is because they were so impressive to me. And yet again, I w- it was one of those things where I was kind of taken off guard because I'm not a fan of these smoked beers at all. They usually in, either taste like bacon or, um, well, you know, Fair American enough. Bacon, yeah, streaky yeah. bacon. Yeah. I should say. Probably not kiwi bacon. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or they just taste like uh, you know I, somebody's you know goose is putting a cigarette out in my mouth or something like that. You know, it's uh, people seem to enjoy that. But but what I what I thought was so fun about the manuka smoked malt is the fact that it is it is mild enough to where you can use it even at thirty to fifty percent of your grain bill and 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 potentially get those more pungent smoky character mm-hmm. uh, or f- smoky flavors without totally obliterating the palate of the person drinking. That smoked beer. Very, very true. Very, it, it has to be an, an interesting. We even ask. Uh, it's a bit like the toffee, you know, the element of surprise. Yeah. You know, we we want to. We we think of this way. Like you're competing. It's a bit like us competing with multinational moldings. It's a tough game. You know, it's not for everyone. It had to be really tough in the head to oh, do that. Oh man, I believe it. And but the brewer, the craft brewers are doing the same. They are putting a fight against the giants. Yeah. So how do you do you win against the giants by being different, by being agile, by by setting up new trends and we're doing the same with the malt so why not um, while your your everyday drinker they're putting a beer that looks like a Pilsner beer when they drink and I said oh my god what is in that beer you know like oh it's Manuka smoke malt you know like wow I didn't think you could do that so just the element of surprise that wow factor all these things that we like to think that we're helping our brewers or our clients to sell more beer so Well, I think you guys are doing awesome things. Um, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me and for being such an amazing person. You're oh. awesome. You're one of my favorite Kiwis. Clo- close your ears, all the people sitting around. Um, you've been so wonderful. And, you're, and, and your oh, product... You're <laughs> Everybody loves Gabby. And, you're, and your product really is incredible. I guess the last question, and this is a tough one, I know, is if, if I'm living in America as I do and I need to get my hands on or I want to prove to you that I really want to try your malts, how can we do that? How do we get our hands on it or how 
how do we how do we get you to, to uh, what can we do to help you get uh, this product over in America? Uh, I think a simple question, simple question to that uh, <laughs> answer to that question. Sorry, goodness, we're yeah, all drinking here. One. Yeah. It was a tough one. Uh, just generate a demand. You know, let, ask us. We will, financially, we will be able to look into it, but it will be just make sure you. You know, the brewers are asking for home at homebrew shops. So, oh, can you get Gladfield in and create a probably a guild where you can bring them out in? And a, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. We we are looking to. I mean, uh, America for us would be a dream having our malts and and some of our most drinkable beers in in the world. Um, I strongly believe, you know, I've had a plenty of fantastic beers here. I think Gladfield Malting is, uh, is responsible for a large part of that. And I think what you're doing for the industry here is fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming to us. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Isn't she fantastic? Ugh, I just love sitting down and chatting with people like Gabby who are so passionate about what it is they're doing for brewing and beer and how focused she is on the home brewing aspect of it. It's just really refreshing to me. Uh, I've maintained regular contact with Gabby since I've returned from uh, New Zealand, and I'm really excited to see what types of stuff they're going to be able to do here in the States. And if you are interested in using those malts, do not be afraid to let your homebrew shops know. Let the people who are ordering these malts know. Um, I've got a kilo of toffee malt that Gabby sent me home with that I'm really excited to put to use very soon. All right, when we return, our final interview with the guys who organized this whole thing, Mike, Ed, and Carl, we're going to talk a little bit about the Brumania and the very unique style of judging that they developed for that competition, as well as the conference in general. Stick with us. We'll be right back. If like me, you prefer the simpler side of brewing beer, you have got to check out the Brew Bag, a food safe fabric filter that allows for mashing of the finest crushed grain without risking the dreaded stuck sparge. I've been recommending these things since I started using them. They are awesome. The Brew Bag offers the only completely reinforced fabric filter for brewing that can be used over 100 times and comes in sizes that fit most mash tons, or you can even have one custom made. Go check the Brew Bag out at brewinabag.com and be sure to use promo code TBP17 to get 10% off your order of $30 or more. So the New Zealand Homebrewers Conference is the brainchild of three very enthusiastic Kiwi homebrewers named Mike Stringer, Ed Bream, and Carl Summerfield, all who put forth a lot of time into crafting what I thought was a fantastic event. Now, unlike HomebrewCon in the United States, the actual conference portion of NZHC is only one day. However, there were other really awesome things that we got to get involved with and that that attendees of the conference can get involved with as well. For example, we went on a hop tour uh, in Motueka uh, where we got to meet the guy who's largely responsible for pushing out the famed Nelson Savine hops. We got to pull Nelson hops off the vine, rub them and smell them. It was incredible. We also did a live demo brew with the Grainfather units at an event called March Fest, which is all about beer and music. And there was cider and stuff there as well. Fantastic time. And then, of course, there was Brewmania, which is this really unique homebrew competition developed by the NZHC organizers. So following the last session on the day of the conference... That's a hint. It was the last session, meaning that we'd been sampling beer all day. I peeled away with Mike, Ed, and Carl to talk about how they felt NZHC went this year. Here we are at the end of the (laughs) the New Zealand Homebrewers Conference. And and I'm here with uh, the three guys who organized this entire thing, which is amazing. Uh, Mike Stringer, Ed Bream, and Carl Summerfield. Um, Thank you so much for having me. No worries, Marshall. It's been fantastic <laughs> to have you guys here. <laughs> no, it's been really good to have you here, and uh, your personality has beamed us to the next level, which is great. I'm going to say, mate, you are the energizer bunny of the brewing world. Um, I'm not sure how to take that, Carl, but... The <laughs> well, I, I'd like to say, first off, that this conference, this is the first uh, homebrewers conference that I've been to outside of the American version, which was now called HomebrewCon. And the organization... Um, first off, it was so well organized that, that I would never have guessed that the three of you uh, are the ones who put it on. No offense. <laughs> 
I know we don't look like it. <laughs> <laughs> has nothing to do with looks, actually. No, but you guys put on such a great show from the first night showing up in the barbecue over at Mike's house uh, to March Fest and all of the, the Brumania judging and all of that. It was just such very different than what we're used to in America, but also so incredibly well put together and so much fun. Uh, were there th- certain aspects of it? I know that you guys did it last year and you had some guests out from America as well. Were there certain things that you guys did differently this year? Uh, we actually made a conscious decision um, uh, when we decided that we'd run it again that we would try to change as little as possible unless there was a compelling reason to do it. Cheers. Um, so that you know, we, we, we took the opportunity to learn some lessons from the first time and, and to focus on those things that didn't work so well, um, but definitely not to, uh, to break a winning formula. Yeah, it's a winning formula. Any, you guys have anything that, about the... I think um, one of the things that we did more successfully this year was we managed to paper over the little hamsters and things running in the wheels behind the scenes. <laughs> Yeah, you did a good job of it because it was it was everything seemed so smooth. The transitions between all of the all of, and I wonder what was the most difficult part of organizing an event like this. Um, well, first, as Mike said, we dished out a lot of the responsibility. <laughs> so don't forget forget all the volunteers that they've, they've helped us tremendously. Yeah. You know, and we didn't dish out just sort of like carry a chair from A to B, yeah. but also a whole like take care of the audio video, which is fucking awesome. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so that that's a big part. Yeah. And then second, uh, we had nine months of weekly at least meetings where we try to be prepared and get more and more prepared. And then you still get caught out on the last week with stuff that you forget. <laughs> I think that's a pretty common thing for uh, event organizers in general is that last minute there's always something that's going to come up. Um, and, and again, I, I've said it a million times, but you guys really kicked ass in this whole thing. And I appreciate you come bringing me out here. I just wanted to say that um, we, we launched the first conference with a, a crowdfunding event. Um, so uh, we we uh, found a crowdfunding platform and and went out there to to hit a funding target. If we sold enough tickets, we'd put it on. Um, and in a, a one month campaign, it was obvious within three or four days that we would have no problem selling tickets. Right on. In the lead up to that, every sponsor that we to- uh, talked to was fully behind it, very happy to support it. Um, they knew that the event would only proceed if enough tickets were sold, so they were very happy to to get in behind. Um, so really, it, it's about the community. The, 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 the people wanted to come. The sponsors wanted to be part of it. The commercial craft brewers were happy to jump on board. And, and being in, in Nelson, um, New Zealand, uh, Nelson Savin is world famous. And yes, when, when we're going over and trying to shoulder tap people in the States to say, how do you feel about coming to Nelson in the hop harvest season? Um, <laughs> the, those that say no say, ask me again next year. I don't know who would say something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this is the, the Brumania event. And I know that you guys did this thing last year and that you've developed some interesting stuff on, on the scorekeeping. It, let, a little background for my American friends. When, when we judge beers, uh, we do it in a very particular way for the most part. Now we do some weird stuff as well it's on the side, but for the most part, we're, we're, um, we are, uh, we're, we're taking score sheets and we are taking beer by beer in a single flight and there's two judges and they judge those things and we take it very seriously. And uh, we've got all these things. Gordon Strong walk by right now. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Who's that? Yeah. <laughs> so, but when we, when we, for the most part, when we're doing judging, that's the way we do it. And, and it boils down to a, usually a best of show round. And in that best of show round, you've got, you know, up, you know, 15 to 20 beers or so that a couple of people end up voting on to be the best beer. Yeah. Uh, Totally unlike that, <laughs> what yeah, we ended up doing. It, it, it's pretty boring to watch. <laughs> it's pre- well, and and <laughs> some would say it's pretty boring to be a part of, <laughs> compared to relative yeah. to what we ended up doing with you guys. What what it, what do you call this style of judging? Is it um, knockoff or knockout judging, or or so, kind of a style like a spinoff of a knockoff or knockout judging? It, it's brewmania, baby. It's uh, brewmania. Okay. <laughs> it, uh, basically, the uh, the idea was to to cross. A kind of um, chess tournament structured elimination process okay. uh, with some Mexican wrestling. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, the, New Zealand already has a very successful um, national homebrew competition. 
Um, and when we put on the, the conference, uh, as soon as we uh, had the idea down on paper, we thought, well, some kind of homebrew judging should be part of this. But we needed a way to make it something that people could come along to and enjoy the experience of taking part. And it was a spectator sport. Um, so really the goal was to try and work out how we could do that um, in a way that's not too onerous. It doesn't mean that homebrewers have to provide 20 litres of beer so that you know, a large crowd of people can, uh, can judge it. And I guess it, it kind of evolved from there over a, a couple of weeks of, of nutting it out. The biggest challenge we had with the, uh, the first, first <laughs> brew mania um, was that um, pretty much by the time the event ran, after talking about it for six to eight months, very, very few people actually knew how it worked. To explain the structure of it um, was too hard. Yeah. Can I just say, there was only one person in existence <laughs> that knew how Brumania worked, and that was Mike. I'm, I'm going to have to guess that Mike is the one who developed the strategy for Brumania. <laughs> yeah. I watched Mike try and explain it to James Spencer from Basic Brewing Radio. He was going to be our MC for the night. And I watched James sitting there and just asking questions and asking questions. And then he shook his head and then he asked a couple more questions. And then he said, I think we'll just figure it out on the night, eh? <laughs> well, I'll admit, I have no clue how it works. <laughs> but but it was the funnest judging I've ever been a part of. Um, without going into too much detail, um, is it, can you explain a little bit about how it works and... and, and um, what what ends up going into it, Ed? Well, just to summarize it a bit, uh, it took me about half a year to put his ideas into an algorithm that actually <laughs> does his job from last year because after that he looked like a zombie of five hours sitting in front of a spreadsheet. Right. Um, that kind of that kind of made us decide to not do that again. I'm sure. Just in case he tries to have another baby like he did last year. So that's right. a different topic. Um, we, I, I, I got to cut you off because I just learned <laughs> that Mike, Mike, one of the or, one of the th- triumvirate of organizers here, had to leave early because he had a baby last year. <laughs> No. Priorities. Yeah. He actually had to leave the night before the conference <laughs> and wake everybody up at two o'clock in the morning and trying to transfer knowledge to us to to get this whole thing running. Okay. Um, just back to the Brumania. So it is it is actually not that complicated. Um, the only thing that's happening is that there's a lot of chips that being are being voted on. So every beer um, you can vote on, and there'll be between three and whatever how many beers depends on, depending on how many entries we get are served on every table. There'll be ten to twelve tables this time we're at twelve, and every judge, meaning every punter, can gets a certain amount of chips, and he votes for the beers that he likes. And we would like them to put one chips per beer, but people ignore it and whatever. So we end up with a with a, an amount of cups A to D, which represent the beers being served, yeah. um, with certain amounts of chips in them, yeah. right? So these chips are being counted, typed into the system, and then the black magic happens. <laughs> um, things like vote percentages come into play, um, and then um, winners on table rounds, and then total vote percentages, where we try to look back in history, because we're not trying to find the best beer. That's the main difference in this competition. We're trying to find the best brewer. Yeah. So, um, in the end, with all this counting that thankfully computers have been invented for, um, <laughs> we fi- figure out who are the 10 best brewers of the competition, of which we then select the five best by mathematical levels. And then you guys, the VIPs, the guys with the supposedly best palette, pick the, the actual winner. So it is a simple system, except it can be very complicated. Well, the, 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 I think the biggest thing, and, and I can only speak for myself, but uh, I met some great people at my table, a bunch of whom are standing right over there. And it was so communal it was like a, it was more of like a social gathering where we were having a blast basically judging people's beer and and there was something so much fun about it and i and, and while there's a place for a more um organized I, I don't mean to say it was disorganized but a more organized and kind of pointed judging system there was something so incredibly refreshing and fun about the brewmania judging the whole time we we've been planning to put on these conferences that one of the things that was a huge aim for us was to bring the brewing community in New Zealand together. Yeah. Um, a lot of uh, brewers, you get into little uh, s- sort of regional areas and things, and we all mix around in Nelson, and that's fun. Yeah. Um, but 
I, oh, you and I were talking about this earlier today after the conference, certainly after Brumania. It's like a big beery hug from yes. the beer community. Um, we all feel like we've shared an experience or, or two um, and we've learned a little bit from each other. There were loads and loads of people talking, people talking to commercial brewers. The commercial brewers were picking up things from the home brewers. Um, and it's actually been a lovely community building experience. And um, Brumania is certainly part of that. Yeah, yeah, it feels that way. Uh, if somebody wanted to learn more about how to do that, and, and it sounds like you guys have some spreadsheets set up to make it easier to calculate the... We actually have developed a software for that, so you don't even have to do the calculation anymore. We're happy to talk to anybody, I would say, right? Yep. Just looking around before they knock me over. Um, <laughs> happy to talk to anybody, happy to uh, talk about the software, etc. So... Um, it's something we would like to have spread around the world because it's a different type of judging, which, as you said, is more fun, more social. Yeah, totally. Uh, the, the way that it's set up now is so that it is reusable event by event, um, and we'd love to take that forward. And, yeah, it, it'll be very easy to, to, to run and to set up. Um, the challenge is, is basically all about marketing yeah. um, and getting uh, uptake from individual home brewers. In order to make the competition work, then you need brewers who are prepared to put in three different beers at the same time and in enough volume so that you can get um, enough beer to serve um, 10 to 12 people twice. Yeah. Um, so for our competition with the, the size of the venue that we had, 100 to 120 people, we needed about 1.8 litres of beer. Half a gallon. Yeah, about a half a gallon. <laughs> half a gallon of three different beers. Yeah. So one and a half gallons of beer in total. Um, from, from each brewer. From each brewer right. um, to have enough beer so that they could go through a knockout round, a finals round, and then a VIP judging round. Yeah. yeah. And if somebody w does want to learn how they can do this or get that stuff from you, is there a way they can contact you about it? Yeah, info at, in, uh, info at nzhc.nz. Yeah. Um, you'll find us there. Well, uh, if it's if it says anything about the way this conference and Brumania in general, or specifically, was run, the fact that there were so many beers to judge, and that we had such a great time judging them as VIPs uh, the, the following day, uh, and and. It, it says a lot about the conference, in my opinion, that it was a very huge success and you guys continue to grow. And I wish you nothing but the best of luck. And I can't wait to come back and visit you again, hopefully sooner than later. Cheers, guys. Oh, what an incredible time that really was. Uh, those guys put on a great show, like I said, and uh, there's there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that one of these days I'll be able to make it back over to New Zealand and hang out with some of the brewers and uh, drink some of the fantastic beer that they have over there. If you ever get the opportunity, I can't recommend it enough. One thing I didn't talk about was the incredible time that my wife and I had in Sydney, Australia, hanging out with my friends Paul, Garrett, and uh, Conan, who, who showed us a whole bunch of different breweries out there. And I want to give a shout out to one of them, Willie the Boatman. We had a fantastic time there. They took us in the back, uh, gave us a, a cool tour of their kind of pieced together Franken machine uh, brewing system. They're making great beer. They're doing good things. All kinds of other great stuff over in Sydney as well. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed learning about what's going on in New Zealand as much as I did. If you're looking for ways to help us bring you this stuff more often, go to brewlosophy.com forward slash support. And don't forget to check out the rewards you can get for helping us out at patreon.com forward slash brewlosophy. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to keep up with everything we're doing. Please send show feedback to Marshall at brewlosophy.com. Cheers to all of our sponsors. We wouldn't be here without them. We will be back in a few weeks with the next episode of the Brew Philosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more.